Hey there students, Tom Ritchie here, and we're here for some more A Push Review. You see, I got a new painting there. Uh, there's George Washington, if you don't recognize that guy. So we're ready for A Push. And this is going to be our you know, last, well, second to last, because we will actually have our regular Monday 9 p.m. review on exam week, okay? Now at next week's review, and those of you who are teachers, I'll make sure to send y'all an email once I've got that. It's just been such a crazy time, but sometime this week, I will make my exam week broadcast schedule. And I will make sure that that is fully publicized at our next uh, at our next week's event. Now, one thing that I want to note here though, is that we've got, uh, let me just run over to, uh, to YouTube. I'm actually, besides these, I am also doing a, series with the Bill of Rights Institute. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and share that with y'all here. Um, we want to make sure, let's see, the Bill of Rights. Okay, and y'all can type this, uh, you know, Bill of Rights Institute. Uh, so the Bill of Rights Institute, uh, we are doing a uh, you know, an AP prep series. And this is basically, I'm doing um, every night, uh, every evening at 6.30 p.m. Eastern, except for Friday and Saturday. Okay, so as far as that goes, I'm going to go ahead and put this up. Uh, yeah, people are, I wonder if it's my camera, because when I'm looking at it here, I'm not seeing that it's offset, but it definitely looks that way. Does it still look that way? I think it's just the way that the camera is on it. Okay, let's see if this is a little little bit better now. Um, let's see. So this needs to, I guess, come up maybe just a little bit, maybe. I don't know. It's just for some reason. Yeah, I know it's looking like that on the camera. Is it better now? What do y'all think? Um, so this, uh, let me note that I've got here that I'm doing these free live streams on YouTube with the Bill of Rights Institute. So tonight earlier, we did the American Revolution. We've got Colonial America here. Tomorrow, early National America. Then Jefferson Jackson, Civil War and Reconstruction, the Gilded Age. Basically, Basically, we're going through all of all of uh, all of AP US history, and that is again with the Bill of Rights Institute. So there's a link there, but you can just go to the Bill of Rights Institute's uh, YouTube page, and you'll see here where we've got you know this is part three starting very soon. Okay, so we've got some things going on there, and it's uh, you know just make sure that uh, you're going here. I just want to make sure y'all know everything we've got. So every night between now and the exam. 6.30 p.m., except for Friday and Saturday, I will be broadcasting with the Bill of Rights Institute. Monday at 9 p.m. next week, I will be doing um, an A-Push review. Now, that's going to be on the early 20th century. Um, I think Raul might have asked me, what about the later period, you know, like Unit 8, Unit 9? Now, I am going to, now, of course, we're going to do that for the Bill of Rights Institute, but I'm going to hold off on like unit eight and nine reviews for my weekly broadcast until we get to the later, uh, the later exams. Now, remember, Bill of Rights Institute, I'm going through the whole thing, but I really, that's my prediction. I don't think that on the first paper pencil exam, we're going to see a ton of post-World War II stuff. That's part of the reason why I'm not really doing something on these Monday night sessions to focus on that material. But again, next week, I will have my full schedule. Also, I want to let y'all know that we are expecting a special guest, assuming that we don't have any technical difficulties or anything like that. We are expecting a special guest to join us uh, sometime this evening. Okay. So that's something that we want to, uh, you know, we want to be ready for. So with that, we will, uh, you know, we'll see if we've got that special guest come in um, probably in about 10 or 15 minutes. And so with that, let me go ahead and start now. Now with, uh, you know, with what we've got here and remember to plug the Romulus A Push review app, just a little $2.99 app. It's at the app store and Google Play. It's just a little trivia app. The questions aren't stimulus based. It's just like, what's this? What's this? What's this? What's this? And little multiple choice things. So again, Romulus A Push review is available at the app store and on Google Play. And so as far as that time um, that, okay, so Dahlia is asking what were the most important laws? laws that were enacted during this time. Now, um, we do have some folks, uh, you know, some folks in here that are teachers. So, you know, Vicky and Raul, y'all uh, be sure to chime in here. Um, as far as this, uh, oh, I'd love to have Vicky live on here sometime. Um, but with that, 
um, the most important laws. Let's think about this. The first thing I'm going to think about is the Sherman Antitrust Act. Okay, the Sherman Antitrust Act um, is the first piece of antitrust legislation that is designed to break up monopolies. Now, what we want to note about the Sherman Act is it was weak. Now, of course, it's kind of misleading because you usually think like Sherman, you think about like just burning everything to the ground. But the Sherman Antitrust Act did not exactly burn trust to the ground. All right. In fact, it was more often used against labor unions than it was used against corporations and trust. So what we want to what we want to note here um, is that when we are, uh, you know, when we're looking at the Sherman Antitrust Act, we want to note that that was a weak and limited piece of legislation. Um, and then it's the Clayton Antitrust Act that was passed during the progressive era that gave stronger antitrust laws. Now, Teddy Roosevelt did, still did prosecute uh, Northern Securities under the Sherman Act. So the Sherman Act wasn't completely worthless. Now, another one that I would note, this is a Civil War piece of legislation, but the Pacific Railroad Act, which commissioned the building of the Pacific Rail, you know, of the transcontinental railroads. So as far as that, uh, as far as that, excuse me, I got a little hiccup. Let me see. Let me hold my breath for five seconds. That seems to work better than some of the other things people say. I'm not going to stand on my head right now or anything like that. Um, so with that, uh, you know, the Sherman Antitrust Act was a result of popular outcry against the trust. And so with that, now another one would be, as I said, the Pacific Railroad Act, which was basically the first uh, time that the government passes a law where they're going to pay direct subsidies to corporations. Now, one of the things I'm always getting into, like people like to talk about the Gilded Age. They like to describe it as laissez-faire. And the thing is, on one hand, you could say, OK, the Gilded Age was laissez-faire because the government didn't do a lot to regulate corporations. But at the same time, the government is doing a lot to help corporations. OK, so, for example, one of the things here where you've got the Pacific Railroad Act, that the government is actually funding corporations, subsidizing private corporations who are corrupt as all get out. Um, and they are giving money to these private corporations to help build the railroads. Now, another thing that I would note is the moral tariff act. When you look at this high tariff, that is not laissez-faire. And so on one hand, you see that the government is, the federal government's not regulating and taxes are low. But on the other hand, you've got, you know, the Pacific Railroad Act, the moral tariff act. Let's not forget how how the government cracked down during this time on labor unions, that any time there was a labor strike or labor violence or anything like that, uh, this is this is something that was, uh, you know, this is something that, you know, this is this is not laissez faire. Um, laissez faire would be the government just kind of staying out of it. But again, that's not what is happening here. OK, so we want to note that in some ways, maybe some ways, not so much. The Interstate Commerce Act, that is another thing that you could point to, is that was an act to regulate the railroads. Another one would be the Pendleton Civil Service Act. Now, the Pendleton Civil Service Act was aimed at the spoil system that had been going on ever since Andrew Jackson. But it got to where every time a new president got into office, they had to entertain all of these office seekers because before the Pendleton Civil Service Act, the president could hire and fire any member of the, uh, you know, anybody who worked in the federal government. So for example, Abraham Lincoln, you know, when he becomes president, you would think he'd need to, he'd need to focus on the secession crisis. Abraham Lincoln spent a lot of his time meeting with office seekers, people who are coming to him like, hey, uh, you, you got elected. I helped. Uh, where's my job? And so he's having to spend a lot of time with that. So the Pendleton Act sets up our modern Civil Service Act, which makes uh, it makes our uh, most federal jobs up to like up to like besides the very highest levels, become civil service positions where you don't lose your job based on who's the president. OK, so that's the Pendleton Civil Service Act. So with this, um, let me see here that uh, that we've got uh, we're going from there. And yeah, the Pacific Railway Act was in, I believe, 1862. The Pacific Railway Act and the Moral Tariff were both passed uh, during the Civil War. Remember, you don't always need an exact year as long as you've got like the right decade. So. 
Going from there, what are some of the most important causes and effects of the industrialization uh, you know, of the United States? Now, one of these, I would say, would be the American Civil War. Okay, War is always something that drives technology. I mean, war is something that, you know, the North already had a much more uh, advanced uh, manufacturing industry than the South. But, you know, when you are at war, you have to, you know, that manufacturing industry industry keeps growing. Now, another thing that happened here is, as I said, where you've got things like the Pacific Railway Act and the Moral Tariff. These are things that didn't have the votes in the Senate before the secession of the Southern states. And so with this, I would say that the Civil War was very important here. Uh, now, also, you know, when you think about the, you know, this is a global second industrial revolution that is happening. So that's something that we're seeing there. Now, as far as the effects of the, uh, you know, of this industrialization of America, uh, we see a few things. Now, we see, first of all, uh, you know, there is a greater discrepancy than there's ever been um, between the, you know, the rich and the poor. Now, on the other side of that, we don't want to act, oh, well, a few people became rich, everybody else came poor, because there is a rise in the middle class, okay? So before this time, even though Mark Twain is kind of cynical and calls it the Gilded Age, and that's something that's kind of stuck, um, that this is actually something that there is, you know, if you, like, when we think about, like, you know, middle class jobs and, like, you know, just, you know, your standard, like, office worker and managerial employment, all of that kind of stuff, that has its roots in the Gilded Age. Now, there's also more urbanization. Uh, that we see that Americans are moving from beginning, you know, they're making this move from rural areas to urban areas. Now, this is something that is going to kind of fuel the progressive era that, you know, and then immigration. So immigration and urbanization, these are things that are going to become priorities in the progressive era. Like, well, we've got to, we've got to do something here um, to address these new concerns. Now, another thing that we're seeing is farmers are, you know, it, it becomes between like the 1890s and the Great Depression, it is a very bad time to be an American farmer because all of this technology is coming out. That's where you see like the Populist Party, for example. Uh, when you're looking at the Populist Party, um, this is something here that is, uh, you know, that is a product of you know, mechanized farming, that farm production is becoming so much more efficient, okay? Farm production becomes so much more efficient. Uh, and so from there, uh, you know, so this is something that, you know, you've got more being produced. So therefore the prices go down, which is great for the marketplace, not so good for the farmers. And so these are a few things that I would note uh, going from uh, going from there. Um, so so going from that, uh, you know, can we explain um, the Native American reservation system? OK, so Ellie, as far as that is concerned, uh, that as the you know, as the United States is expanding into the West and developing the West, um, that there is a growing, uh, you know, a growing effort with the United States government to move Native tribes to reservations that are often off of their tribal lands, okay? So this is something that is important to, uh, you know, to note here that this is, you know, they're moving them off the tribal lands. Now, for one thing, uh, the transcontinental railroads are going through. I mean, that's killing off the buffalo because the buffalo are not, uh, you know, when you look at a buffalo, buffalo herd that's just kind of moseying across the tracks for three hours. It's not very good for them. Um, and so the Buffalo are leaving. And that is, of course, uh, you know, the Plains Indians have been relying on this uh, for quite a long time. And so then also they're finding gold and silver on some of these native lands. And so there is an effort to get them off of those lands with the gold and silver and to uh, get them onto reservations. And so this is, of course, a very regrettable point in our history. Um, but this is largely because of of, you know, partly I would say the transcontinental railroads and then second, that this land that some of the tribes were on was very valuable. Now, I told y'all that we'd have a, we were expecting a special guest. Let's see if we can bring him on without any technical difficulties. I think I see him over here um, in the chat. So let me see if I can go ahead and invite him on here and see what, uh, you know, let's go ahead and invite him on to, um, on the screen. All right. And see if that, uh, see if that works.
All right. Sometimes it takes a second. And sometimes it doesn't work at all. It's sometimes like a bit of a, you know, of a Russian roulette uh, getting somebody onto here. And sometimes it doesn't work the first time, but might work a little bit later. So let's see if we were able to do that. And I've sent the invitation. All right. Looks like he's here. All hey. right. How you doing over there? Yeah, I'm doing good. Doing good. How y'all doing? All right. Okay. Yeah. So we've got uh, got a few students here now. Uh, you know, I'm sure some of them are familiar with you, Steve. But um, let's go ahead, just in case a few of them aren't. Uh, let's go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, my name is Steve Heimler, and um, I am just the uh, the guy trying to eat the crumbs off the floor that Tom Ritchie drops. Um, <laughs> He's the granddaddy of all of us who strive to help you guys on YouTube uh, through uh, videos. So, um, yeah, really glad to be here. And, you know, I, I wish I could stay for the whole thing. Uh, I've got like a short window. But, OK, well, uh, let's uh, let's go and get some uh, get some questions to you and just uh, note that, uh, you know, Steve's channel, if any, a lot of y'all are familiar with it, but uh, Heimler's history, be sure to check that out. OK, so with that, let me see what we've got here as far as our upvoting questions. OK, we haven't addressed the labor movement. So Ellie has a question, Steve. What were some of the key labor union events during this time period? OK, sure. Yeah, let's talk about that. So um, I. I don't know. It looks like you guys have been going on for a little while before I got here, so I don't want to repeat anything. But, you know, the, the Gilded Age in general is is very much defined by the rise of industrial capitalism and a new way of manufacturing, making things. And along with that, um, there was no government regulation on those particular industries. And so one of the one of the consequences of that is that workers were working, you know, 14, 16 hour days. They would go to the, the factory in the morning when it was dark. They would come home when it was dark. Uh, the factory conditions were incredibly dangerous. I mean, I remember reading a story one time, Tom, I don't know if you ever came across this one, but a, a woman's hair got caught in one of the belts and, you know, the, the hair came off along with everything. I mean, it was, it was a terrible story, but the, the point is, hopefully is that the reason for your hair? Is that the reason for your haircut? Like I've been read why. that story. That's why in my industrial workplace wow. here. Um, so, so, but hopefully that'll help you remember. Like these were incredibly unsafe places to work in in long hours um, and low pay. And so the response to all of those grievances was the rise of labor unions. So what you know, the one of the problems that uh, workers had during that time is that they couldn't. The, the, the one voice couldn't change any of that. And so but what they found is that if they gathered themselves together um, in a lot of voices, they could actually get some change going on. So that being the context, um, some of the major things you probably need to know uh, for in terms of labor unions um, would be uh, some of the major unions themselves, like the Knights of Labor, uh, which um, which was sort of the first big granddaddy labor union. <clears throat> um, that one went south after the Haymarket, um, or the Haymarket Square riot. Um, it wasn't actually, there was a bombing there and it was blamed on the Knights of Labor. Probably wasn't there anything to do with them. But the point is there was a big, it was a big labor union. Um, after they decreased, um, you had the American Federation of Labor take their place, led by the venerable Samuel Gompers. Um, and a couple, so you should know a couple of the, the main uh, labor unions. So Knights of Labor, uh, American Federation of Labor. You should also know some of the major strikes. That was one of their main uh, tools to negotiate with these industrial capitalists. Um, you should probably know the uh, Pullman strike, uh, which was engineered by Eugene V. Debs. That's a good name to remember with it when it comes to labor unions. Um, so you had Eugene V. Debs and the Pullman strike, which was a strike on um, sleeping cars in railroads. They were called Pullman cars. Um, you should also know the Great Railroad Strike. There's a lot, lots of lots of uh, grievances against railroads. Um, so so yeah, I would think in a, a short short answer. No, that no, wasn't quite a short answer, but shortest answer I could possibly give. I think that's probably the basics of what you need to know. Tom, did I forget anything? 
Yeah. And, and one thing, you know, Raul also teaches uh, AP government. And that's one thing I think about when you look at these uh, at these strikes that the government and this is one big difference in the progressive era that during the Gilded Age, the government's always intervening against the unions because of the Commerce Clause. And so as Steve right. was saying that this is a, uh, you know, basically like, hey, we've got to get in here because this involves the railroads and the railroads go from state to state. And so, you know, Eugene B. Debs gets put in jail. And while he's in jail, he decides like, you know, somebody left the Communist Manifesto lying around and <laughs> That's uh, right. like, read it. And so, yeah, you know, he goes yeah. from being a, you know, like just kind of a mainstream labor leader to uh, being a full on uh, socialist uh, because, you know, courtesy of the United States government. And that's another thing I mentioned, you know, when people say, oh, the Gilded Age was laissez faire. It's like, you know, shooting, uh, shooting laborers who are striking is not not exactly laissez-faire. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, that's just, just the, it's not the way I see it. But, uh, right. but as far as that goes, Steve, I've got a question here about the exam in general um, okay. from uh, from Azan here and is asking uh, about the weighting of the time periods on the exam. So just kind of a general exam question when they're thinking about yeah. um, their studying. Yeah, I've got it right here, actually. And I just uh, published a video like two hours ago on that. Um, but basically what I said in the video is units three through eight of the APUSH curriculum are more heavily represented on the exam. Um, and then from there, you, so those are all uh, 15 to, let me just tell you the proper percentages here so I don't, um, so I don't get it wrong and lead somebody astray. But three through eight are definitely the one, the big ones that are um, represented mostly. Um, 10 to 17 percent for each uh, unit, unit three through eight. Then the next biggest unit is unit two. And then you've got the small units one and nine. So um, so if you were, you know, uh, crunched for time, definitely focus your energy on uh, units three through eight and then add in unit two. And then if you have time, energy, and you don't want to, you know, dig your own heart out with a spoon at that point, then add in units one through nine, or excuse me, one and nine. Yeah. And so, yeah, one and nine, which we're thinking like the bulk of the course is 1754 to 1980. So French and Indian War to Ronald Reagan. If you're studying that uh, election of Reagan and if you're studying that, that's 90 percent of the course. OK, now, yeah. Steve, uh, I've been I don't know if you, you know, I usually don't like getting into guesswork. But in the Corona days, you know, I am predicting that I, I just don't see it very likely that the first administration, especially a paper pencil, is going to have like a Cold War DBQ or something like that. Do you have any thoughts you're going into there? Yeah, I mean, I, I have thought the very same thing. I can't imagine um, that they would have, I mean, you know, I, th this assumes that the good folks at College Board you know, have their finger on the pulse of American students and they understand teachers and they understand and they feel the pain of it. But like, I ha I have to believe if, at least if they are uh, considering their own, you know, email inboxes, <laughs> you know, purely self-interested, they're not going to have anything, I, I would think, past World War II um, in terms of writing. Now that the if you're taking the digital exam, you won't have an LEQ, but like on the um, paper exam, you will have an LEQ that's beyond that. But um, I just, I don't know. Again, you know, Tom and I don't have any inside information. We're not, you know, we, we don't have college board credentials. Um, but I, I just, I have to believe that they're not going to because so many people started late. So many people aren't finishing. Mm -hmm. So that, that's my guess. I'm yeah, and, and it wouldn't surprise me if like the LEQ4 even is something that is World War II or before that. But then again, you know, they could always say LEQ4 is later. But yeah, this this is something that it's it's a little bit of a thing like we were just doing. And note what Steve's doing there is some point of view analysis, you know, that he's looking <laughs> at. You know, he's not saying that like, you know, this is because the college board is full of good people. There's some good people over there. Uh, but as far as that goes, it's just it's not in their self interest okay to do that so he's using that pov there and so uh so steve you got time for one more yeah let's do one more okay and so and because this is one of the biggest things here when we're when we're differentiating on um, the progressive era and the gilded age you know thinking about you know if we were going to do a comparison sue has wanting a comparison between the populist and the progressives 
the populists and the progressives. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, they're, they, they definitely have a lot of um, uh, similarities um, and they definitely have a lot of uh, um, continuities. Um, the progressives, if we'll start with the, the second, um, the progressives were especially um, keen on um, scientific principles, uh, uh, scientific management, um, trying to um, invest, uh, trying to get the government to invest in a better society. Um, and, um, and so, so you've got movements like, um, uh, women's suffrage, um, you know, the people, um, the, uh, Jane, Jane Adams and her whole house and her, uh, settlement houses, um, uh, and that's, that's interesting there when we're thinking about like with the progressives some of these more middle class priorities like the populists certainly yes. are not like hey we want uh we want women's suffrage and we want to ban alcohol like they're they're not exactly. really about that okay exactly exactly um so yeah i mean i think when i think of um when i think of the uh progressives i think heavy government intervention they believe that uh the government can um, you know, ordered properly can, um, right the wrongs of society. Um, so, so that's the, the, the progressives. Now the populists, um, were, you know, came before, this is really in the Gilded Age at this point. Um, the populists, you know, left wing, um, very, um, uh, agrarian base, you know, th this starts as a, a movement of farmers um, and uh, eventually becomes a party. Uh, and it's very important in the, the southern um, uh, southern portion of the United States, the western portion of the United States. Um, and uh, essentially, you know, what they wanted was to um, that they wanted to support uh, the farmers during the Gilded Age. And it eventually grew bigger than that. Um, but ultimately, you know, what they wanted um, was to, um, they, they, they had issues about money circulation. Um, I, feel, I feel like I'm all over the place here um, trying to organize this. Um, oh yeah, but, welcome to the, uh, the world of the, uh, the live reviews. <laughs> yeah, but, but I mean, I, I guess, okay, it comes down to this. Um, really, really what they wanted was the, the, the right of collective bargaining on their behalf. Uh, they, they were very interested in the federal regulation of railroad rates because um, farmers really got the short end of the stick when it came to this new technology of railroads and how it interconnected the American economy. Um, and uh, so these railroad trusts could um, uh, charge essentially whatever they wanted and uh, to ship the farmers' crops, um, and so so they wanted definitely railroad regulation. Um, they wanted uh, an ex what we call in economics is expansionary monetary policy. Um, they wanted more coinage um, of precious metals because the gold standard was hurting them. Um, and I'm sure that there's other things that I'm forgetting about the populace as well. Um, and I don't know that I made a great comparison there. What um, uh, st stitch this up for me, Tom. What, what am okay, I Okay, yeah, and, and and basically, I mean, we're we're saying in both cases, what we're hearing is both the populists and the progressives want a more expansive role for government. You know, yeah. so they believe because you know the old Jeffersonian mindset, you know, that government is a necessary evil. The government that governs best governs least. So they have that in common is they yeah. want uh, they want more government. Now, it's just that the progressives tend to be more educated. And like, you know, what uh, what Steve was saying about, you know, people like Jane Adams, you know, these are people with educations that want to vote and they, uh, you know, they are which, uh, you know, they tend to want to uh, you know, just champion these middle class priorities and assimilate immigrants as well. You know, that's something that the progressives are thinking, how do we deal with these problems of urbanization? Whereas the farmers, you know, they're being affected on the other side, you know, so the progressives are like, let's, you know, focus on the priorities of uh, urbanites, whereas, uh, you know, the the farmers, they're like, you know what, we're getting screwed by these, you know, by the tariff, by the gold standard, by all of these things that, and that's the other thing that the populist 
some in which some of their political priorities, you know, got picked up by the progressives. So like the um, direct election of senators and uh, stuff like, you know, they wanted more democracy. Uh, so, you know, that's that's something. But then the populists as well, there are things like the gold standard was hurting them. But then their suggestions were like, uh, you know, hey, let's just throw a bunch of currency to where it's going to become worthless. So. So, yeah, but definitely I would say the biggest things is just a, you know, to regulate corporations. You know, there should be yeah. some kind of regulation of business um, and then a more expansive role for government. But then the populists are like, we want to nationalize the railroads. That sounds like a yeah. great idea. Uh, but uh, so so with that, um, yeah, well, Steve, uh, let's uh, let's remind everybody how to find you. And, uh, you know, thanks for uh, thanks for coming by. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, and that was a great explanation. That's why Tom is the granddaddy of all of us. So okay. he just um, passed me up in subscribers a little while ago. So don't let him uh, <laughs> don't let him fool you there. Um, so, uh, yeah, you can find me at uh, on YouTube at Heimler's History uh, at uh, Instagram. It's at Heimler's underscore history. And I'm answering questions there every day about exams. So anyway, thank you guys so much uh, for having me. Sorry, I got to run early, but it sure was good to spend some time with you all. All right. Thanks, Steve. A pleasure. All right. Bye. And, and now I, I actually don't know how to get out. <laughs> oh, okay. Let me that, just kick you out. Okay. So, uh, so there we go. Bye, Steve. All right. So, uh, so yeah, y'all go check out his content. A lot of y'all already have. Um, so, you know, just great. I actually met Steve uh, in uh, summer of uh, 2018 um, at the A Push reading in Tampa. So, you know, we got to meet, and that was, I guess, our first time uh, getting on to, uh, you know, getting on camera together. So that was great, and it's great to see what uh, has happened with Steve's channel. Channel, uh, you know, since I met him a few a uh, few years ago, and he was just getting started. Um, so, with that, ladies and gentlemen, um, let's go ahead. And what I'm going to do here is let's, uh, you know, as we were just talking about the populist, I'm going to go ahead and put something here as far as when we're thinking about the populist platform. You know, this is something that we're taking on one hand political reform proposals, which tend to be furthering democracy. Okay. So they want the direct election of senators. Um, and that, you know, basically instead of the original constitution, which called for the senators to be indirectly elected, you know, through the legislature. So ballot initiatives, they wanted to go around the state legislature and propose legislation directly. So when we think about initiative, referendum, and recall. Now, California right now, it looks like is going to be involved in a recall, you know, that's going on right now. So, you know, California um, recall election 2021. Okay. So this is something that's actually going on now, South Carolina, uh, you know, so we see here now that uh, there is going to be um, a California recall. Now, the thing is, odds are, I don't think that Governor Newsom is popular, I mean, is unpopular enough to lose a seat, but you just never know where this will go. Um, that the whole idea of recalling, okay, expected to be held in sometime in 2021, likely in November, okay? But the thing is, right now, his popularity is not so, you know, is not so bad that, you know, he's probably going to lose his seat. But at the same time, you know, this fanfare, you know, it's just last time there was a recall election, you know, the, the governor was ousted and Arnold Schwarzenegger was the governor of California. Now, there will never be a recall election in South Carolina because we don't have that. OK, so when we look here, states with recall. OK, so states with recall, um, they tend to be now one thing to note here, a couple of things that I'm going to note is Western states. OK, Western states tend to be, uh, you know, tend to be more likely to have recall. OK, so what we see here, uh, this is uh, this is direct democracy in states. So we see here recall and notice that uh, that this is something that as we're looking at this, states that authorize citizen use of the recall process for statewide elected officials. Now, note that west of the Mississippi, most of the states have this. East of the Mississippi, 
very few, just a handful of states, you know, where it looks like we've only got, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven states east of the Mississippi, whereas west of the Mississippi, you see this. Now, also, whether it is, you know, women's suffrage or the legalization of marijuana, like you can look at those maps and a lot of these things that start with these, uh, you know, with these popular uh, initiatives, these are things that are tending to happen in the West and work their way East. Okay. So when we look at, you know, women's suffrage, map united states okay and remember that this is a progressive priority okay this is something the progressives are wanting now when we look here that the the states in dark blue these are states that we see that they already had women's suffrage before the passage of the 19th amendment um and so that's something that you want to note here that most of these again overwhelmingly besides like two of these states west of the mississippi and this is of course sometimes traced to the pioneers you know you think about like you know if i'm going west on the oregon trail and the wagon gets stuck i can't uh you know i can't say to my wife like hey you stay in the wagon and be a good lady we're gonna push this out um that women on the frontier had to take on uh you know a much bigger role and so with that uh you know this is something that is um, just incredibly fascinating how this goes from the, you know, from the West to the East when we're looking at this. And so uh, that's something that is important to note. Now, also, when we look at the economic reform proposals, now note here that the graduated or progressive income tax. Now, you can see right now, for example, President Biden wants to raise taxes on high earners, not on everybody necessarily, but he wants to take our graduated income tax where people who make more money pay a bit more than people who make less and wants to make it a tad bit more graduated. Okay. So basically an income tax, which there was no federal income tax before the, you know, at least permanent before the progressive era. So notice here where we've got direct election of senators, graduated income tax. These are two things that the progressives end up putting into the constitution because the populists and the progressives have this shared goal of like, you know, government can actually help us. Um, the secret ballot, which this is a way to be able to vote and not be intimidated. Okay. Now it may, you know, it, it does, you know, it makes things a little bit, sometimes the ballot's difficult to count if there's a problem. Uh, you know, you don't know how people voted. You can't quite trace that. But at the same time, it's worth it to have, uh, you know, a system where people can't be intimidated for their vote. So like, you know, you went and voted against your employer. Well, you're not going to lose your job. So this is something that the secret ballot is now kind of a given in the United States. Now note some things like this, where we're just going to like coin everything that doesn't really come up, uh, you know, with the progressives and also the nationalization of the railroads, which means that the progressives wanted the government to take over the operation of the railroads to basically take them from the corporations, which when you think about it, uh, these corporations, they, except for the Great Northern Railroad, which Northern Securities was the company that Teddy Roosevelt broke up, the monopoly, but besides the Great Northern Railroad and a handful of others, most of the transcontinental railroads were uh, they were built, uh, you know, with government subsidies. And so basically these corporations had built railroads with government subsidies and then were running it for their uh, for their own profit. And so with that, let me take a little look at Instagram, see if we've got any, uh, you know, any recent uh, followers that I need to shout out to. Um, we've got Ted Master 7. Um, let's see, Emma LaDuca and Lindsay Bernard, okay, with uh, with recent follows there. Um, and so with that, uh, let's see, Isabel uh, Dunka and uh, Lily and Maya, um, which some of these might have been in the Euro broadcast earlier. So as far as that uh, as that goes, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'll do another shout out before we uh, before we end this. Uh, so with that, and I'll be going a few more minutes here. And remember that we will begin our you know a push broadcasting uh, you know all at the same time that we've been doing it. Same time uh, next week, nine o'clock on Monday. AP government will be done with. So again, I'll have a full and I'll send out the broadcast schedule to y'all by. 
by email as well. Um, so going from there, um, let's see as far as that uh, as far as that goes. Um, continuities and changes. Now, Native Americans, Divya, what you want to note about Native Americans um, is that uh, you know Native Americans during this time the viewpoint of our government was to assimilate okay the viewpoint of our government was to assimilate native americans and so going from there um you know we see here that the target was assimilation so the dawes now the dawes act not the dawes plan remember dawes act indian indian reservations and legislation 18 80s, okay, which, uh, you know, late 1800s, Gilded Age, and then the Dawes plan in the 1920s having to do with getting, you know, bailing out Germany um, so that they could pay their reparations and that the Allies could pay their loans. So the Dawes Act basically took the reservations that had been part of the tribes and they gave the land to individual families. And then they took the surplus land and said, that's open to white settlement. Because remember that when Jackson uh, moved the southeastern tribes to present day Oklahoma, Indian territory was practically that whole state. But in the 1890s, that is opened up to white settlement. So you see an assimilationist, um, you know, kind of view here. This is a point. This is a point in time where, uh, you know, young uh, native children are being sent, I think, usually on a voluntary basis. But I could be mistaken on that. Uh, you know, in Canada, it wasn't necessarily voluntary. But you know this you know you had these indian schools like basically indian boarding schools where they would uh you know get these uh these young men and they would put them in rooms with someone who was from a different tribe so that way they would have to speak to each other in english they couldn't use their tribal language with a roommate from a different tribe now um you know this is something that would not be seen as uh you know especially um, you know, especially appropriate today. Um, but at the same time, you know, at that time, that was their their objective was to assimilate. And we see that happens during the progressive era too, just in general, you know, to assimilate immigrants and that sort of thing. So, so going from there, um, you know, we want to note that that's the policy and assimilation is policy, but also trying to, uh, you know, put natives on as little land as possible and open up the rest of the land to white settlement and white uh, gold and silver prospects expecting and that sort of thing. So going from there, um, you know, so let's, oh, the car. Okay. So yeah. So the Carlisle Indian school, which was, I think open until like world war one or so. Okay. Yeah. So you had Jim. Yeah. So there were some, actually some very like, uh, you know, some very well-known Americans that went to school there. So even though that is something that is heavily criticized by a lot of people today, I mean, it was by the standards of that time, uh, you know, people believe that they were in, engaging in a form of philanthropy. You know, when we think about philanthropy, that's another thing. Philanthropy is, it's not charity because charity, it's like, I see somebody, I give them, uh, I give them some money because I have extra and I feel pity for them. Now, philanthropy is when I am giving money to someone or something where I'm advancing society in some ways. Okay. Um, as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, when we think about uh, the, uh, you know, when we think about, let's see, um, the arts, public health, or, uh, you know, public health, the arts or education. OK, so Carnegie, for example, with all of the libraries, uh, you know, Carnegie with Carnegie Hall, uh, you know, then we're when we're going um, when we're going from, uh, you know, for example, Rockefeller. Spelman College in Atlanta, which uh, Spelman College is a historically black girls school. And this is actually Spelman College in Atlanta is named for, uh, you know, John D. Rockefeller's wife, who had been like active in the abolitionist movement. And so this was something that the Rockefellers were very, very instrumental in setting up this college. And the federal government wasn't exactly looking for ways to, you know, looking for ways to educate young black women at that time. So, you know, when we're looking at philanthropy, um, you know, you can see a picture where Andrew Carnegie went to the Tuskegee Institute and took uh, pictures with Booker T. Washington. And so we want to note here the Gilded Age philanthropy, that these were efforts to actually make society better. This is Andrew Carnegie's gospel of wealth, so to speak. Um, so, so from there, it's important to note just some of the good that was done here. I always ask students, have you ever gotten yellow fever? And when they say no, I'm like, well, thank you, John D. Rockefeller. Um, so, so with that, now, 
the thesis asking about stand it the thesis standing out um one of the things that i think that you know you want the reader not to have to think about is this a thesis the most important thing is somewhere in your thesis if the word because doesn't appear look at your thesis again because you can't just state your opinion you have to give a line of reasoning so the best advice that i can give when it comes to thesis writing is to have a line of reasoning okay that's very very important to have a line of reasoning that it's because okay so like you know this is happening here because this okay because if you just say that this happened a thesis is not about what it is about how or why how did this happen or why did this happen okay those are the two things that you really need to uh need to look for and so with this uh you know when we're thinking about this divya i don't get into predicting dbqs and leqs now as i was saying earlier with steve though i am saying highly unlikely we're going to see a post-world war ii dbq i would say even marginally unlikely that we're even going to see a 20th century dbq i would think that for the paper pencil i'm expecting that it would be pre-1900 i could be wrong but i would say i mean post-world war ii it's just like steve was saying i mean they know um the just the hate and the vitriol that would be thrown at them if the dbq on the early may paper pencil uh yeah although is another great one okay so when we're thinking about complex understanding maya um although i think that that is always going to be something that is uh that is good there and so with that yeah so when we're thinking about this now faith uh when we think about the first industrial revolution or the commercial revolution or market revolution uh you know you're very welcome amanda and so with that uh you know as we're going through this uh you know that was largely a true laissez-faire you know there wasn't a whole lot of help from the government i tell you what sony just went on this uh on this light spree um that was my goodness okay she took a break from competition dancing to go on one of the most epic life you know the most epic light sprees i've ever seen so much so that anybody who just followed me i can't see that you just followed me because she went and wiped so many photos that it got rid of my it just obliterated my entire uh you know news feed there or whatever so uh so sony um thank you for your enthusiasm there but i want to apologize to those of you i can't shout out to because of that um so when it comes down to it you know we think about like the easiest way to explain this is in uh you know in ap euro how many of y'all hopefully some of y'all took ap euro last year um is ap euro we talk about the first industrial revolution the second industrial revolution first industrial revolution steamboats cotton gin you know cotton gin which basically something that just works with a hand crank okay first industrial revolution is going to a certain extent and then the second industrial revolution is where you have like the mass production of steel okay so that's what you're seeing like when we're looking at before the civil war for example uh you know we're not seeing the mass production of steel okay and kai sasser okay kai uh you've been noticed so you don't necessarily have to go on quite as big of a light spray because I want to be able to know if uh, people followed me and be able to shout out to them. But thank you so much for that. Um, anyway, and so with that, the first versus the second, because when you think about the railroads, uh, you know, you think about uh, Carnegie Steel, uh, you think about Standard Oil, electricity, you know, electricity, you know, when we think about um, the 1893 Columbian Exposition World's Fair that's like lit with electric lights. So it's really the difference difference between the first and the second industrial revolution on a global scale. So glad we could, uh, you know, we could do, we could do with that. Now, Richard, I don't think exact dates, like knowing the exact date of something, like for example, when I was on with the Bill of Rights Institute earlier, um, it's not so much exact dates as the Sugar, Act, the Sugar Act, the Stamp Act, the Townsend Acts. I could say Sugar Act, 1764, Stamp Act, 1765. Townsend Act, 1767. I do this for a living though, okay? This is my job. It's not your job. So Sugar Act, Stamp Act, Townsend Act, 1760s, okay? Right after the French and Indian War. Uh, now, things like July 4th, 1776, December 7th, 1941, 
those are important, but every date is not important. Okay, so that's something to uh, you know that's something to note uh, to note here. Um, so with that, you know, we can certainly see if, you know, Vicky's being volunteer. Okay. Yeah. She is not volunteering. Um, now note here that, uh, you know, Steve mentioned the Haymarket affair and the Haymarket affair, which really led to like the decline of the Knights of Labor because they, whether justly or unjustly, got blamed for it. Uh, that, uh, you know, what we're seeing there is that, you know, all like basically they, they had two flyers that went out. I call this the AM flyer and the PM flyer. Um, that there was, uh, you know, this like, let me let me go ahead and pull this up. OK, because this is something like you wouldn't uh, you wouldn't believe this unless I, you know, unless you saw it. Right. Um, so let's go ahead and go here. And if anybody wants to take like a screenshot or something like that, um, I've got something here. Let me go ahead and put my, you know, go ahead and share my screen with you. Um, so there are four labor strikes that I would bring attention to total. OK, so the Great Railroad strike the Haymarket Affair, the Homestead Strike, and the Pullman Strike, okay? And notice there, that is where, uh, you know, you've got two of these are railroad strikes having to do with interstate commerce and that sort of thing. Now, the Haymarket Affair, uh, what happened here is this began as an eight-hour workday protest, okay? So now let me see, I've got, uh, got a few new um, folks on Instagram. Let's see, Emily Grusso, and this is a good time to tell your friends to follow as well, because I can shout out to them. So, uh, you know, text your friends in the group chat. Let them know that I'm doing shout outs right now. Um, let's see. Uh, Kaylin, uh, you know, let's see. Kaylin Aldi and Amy Bernard, I suppose. All right. So uh, so thank you all so much for your, uh, you know, for your recent uh, for your recent follows. And so going from there, when we look at the Haymarket affair, I tend to look like they've got the what I call the AM flyer and the PM flyer. Now, I don't know when these get, but basically this is something that uh, that basically there's a mass meeting tonight at 730 o'clock. Hey, market. All right. Now, note here, it says on this flyer, working men, arm yourselves and appear in full force, you know, before it says, you know, then it's got the German version. You know, so basically you've got these, uh, you know, it's aimed at some, you know, German immigrants um, that are that are going to show up there as well. So a lot of these workers, this is in Chicago, which was the meatpacking capital. And so they're putting this in German and in, uh, you know, in English. Now, note here, working men arm yourselves and appear in full force. Now, one thing that a lot of people like, you know, we're talking about AP government, you know, which uh, Raul, we need to get in touch because I do need to do a gov stream sometime this week before my night before. And I might even do I, I may be able to do it tomorrow. Uh, let me think about this. Like I may be in a position to do a stream for AP government. Um, possibly tomorrow, um, but certainly at some point I need to do some, you know, something before the night before stream. Um, but with that, like there's nothing inherently unconstitutional about an armed demonstration. OK, like basically like as long as the laws of the state or the, the locality allow for open carry, like there is nothing inherently unconstitutional or illegal about someone showing up with a weapon like, you know, Virginia. I think a year or two, you know, maybe it was uh, maybe it was about a year ago um, that in Virginia they had like about 30,000 gun owners like show up, a lot of them openly carrying firearms and nothing happened. Like it just went off without a hitch. There was nothing, uh, you know, no, no violence or anything like that. And so, uh, which, uh, you know, it was one of those things there, there weren't a lot of counter protesters at the gun rights protest. You know, you see like a lot of places you've got like protesters and counter protesters. Um, the gun rights folks are protesting for some reason, there just aren't too many counter protesters, but it went off without a, it went off without a hitch. So we want to note here when they say working men arm yourselves and appear in full force. Now, the thing is though, Maybe not the smartest advice. OK, even though it's legal, maybe not the smartest advice because, you know, you're kind of, you know, I don't know. It's just just not the best advice. And they realize that. OK, so here they're like basically like bring a gun. OK, or bring something, bring a gun, bring a club, whatever you've got. You notice how that goes away. But this isn't like today's text messaging where you can just recall it. You know, you can't just say, oh, you know, I don't do that. Actually, we changed our mind. 
recall the last text. Uh, you know, if they saw this, that's what they're doing. And somebody like, you know, doesn't just bring like a club or a gun, but they bring a pipe bomb and it kills people, including a cop, you know, and it's like, it's all fun and games until a cop gets killed. Okay. And so this is something that, uh, you know, Matthias J. Deegan, who was a police officer, he was killed in the pipe bomb explosion. And so this is one of those things that public opinion of labor unions in general, and especially the Knights of Labor, you know, basically this idea that, you know, you've got these, you know, there were eight people, I believe that, yeah, there are eight of them here, um, but they're hanged, like eight anarchists, uh, you know, eight anarchists, most of them, if not all, all of them of foreign birth were hanged uh, as a result of this, uh, you know, as a result of this tragedy. And so this is something that, you know, definitely like turned a lot of people against uh, the labor movement. And Steve mentioned earlier, um, Samuel Gompers. Okay. So when we're looking at Samuel Gompers, um, he was the leader of the American Federation of Labor. And Gompers was somebody who helped bring like labor unions to the mainstream. Like he would only organize, uh, you know, groups of, uh, you know, he would only organize typically um, groups of skilled white men. Okay. So while Eugene Debs was much more egalitarian and socialist, uh, you see here where, uh, you know, Eugene Debs is is, uh, you know, he's organizing people regardless of skill, regardless of race, um, whereas Samuel Gompers is really just kind of embracing the spirit of the time. And, uh, you know, the American Federation of Labor, you know, became like very anti-immigrant as well. And it's just, you know, embracing the spirit of, look, we're skilled people and we are looking out for ourselves and all we want, we want an eight hour work day. We want uh, higher wages. We want better working conditions. This is known as bread and butter unionism. So Samuel Gompers is saying, you know, I'm not trying to question the fundamentals of American capitalism. We just want to work less. We want to be paid more for it. And we want, uh, you know, the workplace to be a little safer. So we're not, uh, you know, having to, uh, you know, cut off uh, the top of our hair uh, to keep from getting caught, caught in the machine, you know. Um, so as far as that uh, that goes, that's a that's a great question, Raul. That's an excellent question. So I just need to figure out when I'll do it. But I know that I'm going to go live the night before the AP government exam. Um, but it's just a matter of when I'm going to do that in uh, in addition. Um, so with that. Uh, oh, so Vicky, you teach both subjects as well. OK, good to know. Well, with that, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for joining me tonight. Again, I will be emailing y'all as soon as I've got the full schedule of reviews for next week, which is the first first exam week. Um, and uh, now from there, let me do a quick poll. Okay. Let me do a quick poll here. Um, when are you taking the exam? Okay. So uh, early May, late May, or early June. Okay. So let's look and see what we've got here. Because one thing I'm going to try to, I'm trying to figure out is how much should I schedule like before the uh, late May and early June administrations. Okay. So a lot of y'all take an early May or at least the early voters here. All right. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, with that, yes, I will definitely go live the night before the exam. That's definitely happening. There will be some fireside chats next week as well. Um, for those of y'all taking a push, there will be some premium and fireside chat, stuff like that. Okay, we got a lot of early May. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, looking forward to it. Y'all check your email. Also remember, Bill of Rights Institute, every evening on their YouTube channel, 6.30, free of charge. Uh, Y'all, uh, you know, feel free to come and join us. So with that, uh, it is always a, tr uh, always a pleasure. And you're welcome, Suha. And I am uh, just uh, so thankful for y'all's support. All right, have a good one.